So, uh, hi everyone. Uh, you know, we're at the PHP meetup. Uh, tonight we have Chris McCooey and Stephen Eaton uh, from our business unit. They're going to be talking about how they use an API backend to a Symphony front end still, right? Yes. Um, to get some distributing of their business logic, their APIs, all that fun stuff, and how they deal with their keeping their models consistent between all the different components and layers. Um, as usual, does anybody have any sort of announcements or anything like that they want to mention before we get started? Before. Hi, I'm Yvonne Galvin. I'm with LetsTalk.com. <coughs> We're a, a wireless e retailer on the street on Mission in Maine here in San Francisco. And we're looking for some PHP developers. Um, we're about an 11-year-old company. The CEO, Deli Tamer, uh, launched the company with a round of funded, funding of $22 million about 11 years ago, first and only funding. We're doing really well, growing a lot. Uh, we're up to about $100 million in revenue. I have a job description here if anybody would like a copy, and I'll leave them on the table from the side. And we're also looking for a senior uh, architect. If anybody can refer anybody, please contact me. Thanks. Anyone else hiring, looking to be hired? Other events? <clears throat> so uh, the 22nd is the next MySQL meetup. Uh, that's going to be about SSA, SSD drives, um, so all sorts of fun stuff with MySQL. In the NoSQL realm, on Wednesday, the 23rd, uh, Salvatore, 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 does anybody know how to say his name? No? Oh, anyway. Um, creator. Salvatore. There we go. Um, we'll be here, so be good stuff talking about Redis. Um, other than that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Chris to get started. <laughs> You hear me? Is it working? Yeah. No? Good. I'm Chris McCooey. I'm from. Uh, I work for CBS Interactive, uh, and primarily on the business sites. Um, so in this picture right here, you might be wondering where we fit in. Where, where this picture? These business travelers <laughs> represent our business. So that's how we fit into that. And um, I'm kind of the warm-up act. Uh, Stephen Eaton, who's on my team, is going to talk a little bit um, about what we're doing with. Symphony and PHP and uh, how we're actually dealing with models. But I'm going to provide some context for, for why we do the things that Stephen's going to talk about in the first place. And that has to do with the um, API strategy that we adopted a couple of years ago. So uh, let me go ahead and get into this. Um, so in 2008, uh, our president, Neil Ash, he threw down the gauntlet and said um, that each business unit needed to develop an API-based uh, approach to content delivery and data exchange. And so uh, the business tech team got together and, and uh, we took a, what I'm calling a values-based approach um, to sort of deciding how we were going to do this. I mean, API is a pretty ambiguous term. I mean, it means a lot of things to a lot of people. And so we wanted to figure out, you know, if we're going to take this approach uh, and wind up with a solution that, that sort of we're being asked to develop, you know, what's the way that's going to best sort of serve our, uh, serve our needs within our business unit. Um, so the values that we were looking at were um, availability, like who, who's going to use this API, um, improvement, where can the API help improve development efficiencies, reuse, um, what do we have that we can leverage, innovation, so, so what unique things can we actually apply this API to that we aren't doing today with other, with other stacks, uh, and then Ease of adoption. If we build it and nobody comes, then there is no point in building it. So we have to ensure that when we build this, uh, there'll be a way to um, get our producers and our engineers to sort of get on board and, and uh, use this in a way that's, that makes sense for them. So who will use the API? When we looked at it, you know, um, the, the consumers of this API on our side re really are primarily internal. So we're going to use it. You know, we're going to use it for driving our own sites. Um, uh, the exception to that is uh, there's a possibility that other business units within CBSI would also use it. Uh, and then um, and there's a probability that external customers, business partners, um, uh, folks that we're, we're doing deals with and that sort of thing could also take advantage of it. Um, in our case, we didn't have sort of a, uh, sort of a syndication you know, sort of um, it's API strategy in terms of sort of releasing this to developers to do widgets and that sort of thing. It was really more primarily at this point about how do we, you know, add efficiencies to our own operation. 
So improvement, where can the API help develop some uh, improved development efficiencies? Um, so domain-oriented modeling through the API method. We wanted a way to really model um, the application uh, at a point that was in front of the, the universe of data that we support in the back end. So we wanted the API to actually provide a, uh, a buffer, an interface, and persistence for, uh, for that data. Um, we wanted to be able to reuse the data uh, across multiple sites. Um, we wanted to actually have methods that could be um, reused um, you know, for, uh, for sort of widgets that, that pop up all over the place um, just for that, for that level of efficiency. Um, abstraction, um, we wanted to have the capability of, of changing the back end out um, and, and persisting the front end so there would not be so that that wouldn't be an issue. So we actually can develop a migration plan for our backends that wouldn't be affected by the way we're serving data to the front. Um, so the API actually creates that level of security so we can, we can do that. We can literally swap and change the system in the back end, but the API interfaces could be, um, can never change, the front ends will still operate. And then performance. Um, one of the things that we were looking at is how can we use the API to, I peer to uh, improve performance for our sites? Um, we knew going into this that, that it was going to change the operation of how we were actually uh, running the sites. A number of our sites were essentially sort of client-server types of applications, web app-based uh, stacks using you know, uh, MySQL databases and Java front ends. So there was a lot of local data. By pushing everything behind an API, we're creating latency. So we knew that we were going to have to deal with that in some fashion. Um, so the way we address that is by attaching a cache form to the API itself. So the API actually has its own caching layer. Um, in front to give us some more uh, some more persistence. Reusability. Um, what do we have that we can be leveraged for this API system? Do we have to throw the baby out with the bathwater and start over, or do we have systems that we can we can use currently? And the answer is we didn't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. We wanted to be able to utilize our legacy systems. So with the API, we were actually able to create uh, a dispatcher tier that would interface with the API. Um, that we could send uh, requests through to the back-end systems as they exist and do essentially sort of transformations at the API tier to sort of allow the legacy systems to, to persist and, and look a little different coming forward. Um, other in enterprise APIs, um, some of our systems are actually utilizing some of the other APIs within CNET, and uh, we use our API as, as a proxy in some cases to pull from those APIs to do a different kind of cache and maybe change the model and then push things forward. And then um, we, have, we had an existing service tier architecture uh, that was based on Tomcat and Spring um, that we liked. It was pretty high performance. Um, we could leverage it and essentially use that architecture to build up our, our API tier. Innovation. So um, what business requirements can be addressed with an API strategy, that, things that we weren't necessarily already doing? Um, so again, domain-specific instances of the common data sources. Um, so for instance, um, I might have a, a, a web-based app and a mobile-based app using almost entirely the same kinds of data, but through the API, I can model them slightly different. So it gives me some flexibility around those kinds of applications. Uh, unified presentation of data sources. So uh, we have multiple CMSs. Um, Analysis data, so things like, um, you know, how many, uh, what's, what's most popular, how many votes do we have, you know, what are the vote totals, things like that. Search listings um, through the API, everything sort of looks very similar uh, to the front end. So, um, so we don't have to worry about having to have sort of madly different sort of model representations of the data. Um, composition of two or more data sources. So one of the issues that we deal with is thing, use cases that deal with things like data injection. So you have a, a blog post, and the blog post has counts of votes. Uh, it has um, sort of popularity results, things of that sort. Can we use the API to actually put those things together and create a single model coming out? Or do we need to composite everything on the front end? And uh, the, the intent of the API is to actually support that as well. Um, performance tuning. Um, so the ability, the ability to use the API to actually tune specific methods uh, using the cache form that I mentioned earlier. So uh, I have a 
channel for a specific blog request, and uh, and I and I know that that I'm going to get slammed on that blog request because there's an event coming up. So on a, on a specific blog request, I can actually apply a, a specific cache expiration to sort of deal with that. It doesn't affect everything else. And then data validation uh, pre-production by business stakeholders. This is the big one. This is this this is something that we're continuing to work on. Um, the way that we build apps today, um, it's not all about sort of the, the glossy side of the application. It's not about necessarily what the page looks like today. It's about the data that serves the page. And so moving forward, we need a way to actually get together with, with the product folk, um, marketers, uh, um, people, editorial folks, and show them the data that we've got and, and talk about the application from the standpoint of what does the data look like. And so the API and the tools that we have behind it can be, provide a mechanism of talking about data in a, in a way that hopefully is in a language that we can all sort of speak, um, rather than just sort of throwing sort of a bunch of abstract you know, data at them and say, figure this out. You, you wanted this, right? Um, we want to actually be able to have a tool that we can sort of show them, share with them, and work with them on getting the data model right before we even talk about interfaces. And finally, adoption. Um, again, uh, to leverage this approach, um, will we need to change the front end of the way that we do things? Um, or what, what has to change? So a couple of things that we need to be able to do is make multiple API data requests in a batch. Um, because we, you know, rather than pulling everything from one data source, we're pulling things from multiple sources. So we need to be able to batch those up. Um, be able to efficiently render and reuse the data models across sites. You mentioned that earlier. Um, we really believe we needed to have a framework approach um, to support how we're going to use the API um, so that we have some consistency in the way that folks are actually using things. Um, so we don't get a spaghetti code land and, uh, and, and that the models have kind of a unified um, look to them across sites, across apps, and the reusability is really a real thing. Um, and then the learning curve has got to be pretty fast. Because this was a this is a pretty aggressive initiative. We brought the API up in 2008. We needed to deploy sites with it. In in 2008, we didn't have six months to figure it out. So we needed to to use tools in front to deploy this that that our developers would be able to get the speed with quickly, and and be very efficient. So that brings us to the next subject, and this is my lead into Stephen here. Um, what is Iris? Iris is essentially the front end platform that we built to actually be the tool set that we would use uh, to interact with the API. And uh, a big chunk of Iris is the Symphony framework. So I don't know if you're familiar with that or not, but it's essentially it's an MVC framework, uh, model view controller. Um, there's a couple things about it that we liked when we started that we still like about it. Um, you know, it just has built in things like object auto loading, uh, URI routing, uh, you know, good support of templating and template helpers. Uh, it has built-in caching, debugging, and plugin support extensibility. Um, in addition to Symphony, we're using a couple of Symphony plugins. On top of it, um, we borrowed from, we didn't borrow, but they're available and created by uh, the Yahoo folks. Um, one is the uh, API client plugin, which is essentially a wrapper around uh, PHP's uh, curl multi, uh, asynchronous curl functions. and uh, it allows us to sort of have a kind of a conventional way of, of setting up API calls uh, within the platform uh, and batching them up and sort of stacking them, managing them all through kind of a, a, a persistent pipe. And then the other plugin that we're using is um, the YSF Dimensions plugin. And this gives us, um, this sounds really fancy, but it's, it's, it's not as fancy as it sounds, but, um, you know, <coughs> configuration-based multi-dimensionality to apps. Um, and all that means is um, I have the ability of using sort of configurations to, to take advantage of in the inheritance that's already built into Symfony. So, um, so we're using uh, dimensions for doing things like creating um, our international sites, uh, the distinction between our international <laughs> sites and our domestic sites, um, for doing things like maintaining different environments. Uh, so. Um, so if we have different templates that we would serve for a given site, or we have different configurations, different API calls, we can use the dimensions tool to actually sort of uh, essentially model those through configuration in Symfony. And then Iris is also the, what we call the CNB library is essentially our proprietary library of objects, models, and um, 
the various helpers that we've created ourselves to drive the sites. Um, so the types of things that we that we care about, the things that drive our sites are advertising, uh, information and management around the user, registration, tracking, uh, various helper functions, content and other data models, and then containers, reflection, and builders, oh my, that's Stephen's going to talk about. So this is my lead in, Stephen, so if you want to come on up. And I'll just leave you. These are the sites that we've deployed so far with this platform, starting with uh, reviews in uh, October 2008, final articles January uh, 09, industries somewhere around May 09, Money Watch, Smart Planet. Um, the most recent site, and this is what Stephen's going to be talking about, is we re, um, redeployed ZDNet using this platform. So everything on www.zdnet.com is being driven by this platform on the front end. So without ado, Stephen. Chris talked about our platform a little bit. Um, it, this is just, you know, kind of a, a kind of re-emphasizing what we have here. Uh, we run on 71.4. Uh, we're using the YSF API Cloud plugin, the Dimensions plugin, um, PHP 5.2, 5, 5 uh, and the other, the other, you know, thing that I really want to, you know, hit on is that these sites are fully a API driven and support JSON or XML mainly for uh, building <coughs> objects and models. So, the big problem that, that, that we noticed after after we launched the first of all sites is that we have a lot of, of copy code, a lot of code that, that we, where we would be, you know, to, to create all these different, uh, you know, URIs to build these API calls and take these API calls and translate them to a model. So, we spent most of the time developing each site just going through and copying, you know, copying getter, get method, a set method, then copy the code that would, you know, create these requests, which which always, you know, leads to bugs. And, and if you're spending a lot of time copying code, you know something's obviously wrong with the setup. So, well, you know, being I, I have a uh, very much have a Java background, you know, kind of, you know, the first uh, things that I worked with at, at the company were uh, mainly Java platforms. So, you know, it kind of led us out to looking more for like an ORM solution. So, really, you know, a way to instantiate these these objects, these beams, you know, from a feed rather than from a database. Uh, you know, Java. We had things like Spring, uh, I've added a hybrid that we would use to to populate our, our, our beans from from the database. And in PHP, we have you know similar things that you know such as Docker and Propel. Uh, Symfony's also started to uh, you know to incorporate their own uh, ORM methodology in their in their service containers. And, and really, what what the what they were designed for is is you know you, you'll create a beam, but this you know and creating the next object. You would pass the, the the first object too. So you know you, you create like a, a an object that basically contains configuration, and you would pass it to to build the actual model for the page. So they were they were sort of starting to go down that approach, and, and we kind of took that and went a little bit further with it. So the requirements for for our ORM are to have it be able to accept multiple parameters, to be able to construct and make the API calls without having to copy and paste the code be able to map objects to the results that we ret retrieve from these API calls, and also to make the API calls in parallel. That's really the, the key thing that, that we needed this to be able to do, because we, we could easily you know, set up some configuration that would allow us to you know, pull a model, but could it set up, could we be able to find a way to set up all the calls prior to uh, making the first call so that we can, we can do them all at once, so that we could maintain the, you know, the speed that we need uh, on these pages, and it also had to be flexible. It couldn't it couldn't be something that was only configuration based or only able to be used a certain way. We had to be able to be able to use it in multiple ways. We have some pages that require one feed, we have some pages that may require you know six or seven feeds. So it had to be able to handle both cases without um, issue. So the first thing we'll, I'll go through is the the builders, and this is an example of of a very very simple model that we have. Um, looks very much like a like you know, like a typical uh, you know, Java beam, really almost. Um, and what what we get here is the response comes into the constructor. Uh, we take that and we would set properties. You know, this one we just have one property, which is links. But in this case, it's also a the, uh, each link is its own object. So we take the results, <coughs> go through the tree, and create the object. So each each time we introduce a new API, before what we were having to do 
is we would take the API results and we'd have to go through each property, you know, define where it was, uh, you know, define a variable to you know to hold the value, and then go through and set up these these getter and set methods uh, so that we could use them on the front end. So the builders, what we, what we really wanted is we wanted singleton access to, to these to these builders so that we wouldn't have to worry about scoping issues. We didn't want to you know have something where we had to create it here and set it into the, the page scope to be used later on. We wanted to be able to set it in action, set it in a component, or even access it via the template. We didn't want to have any kind of um, issues there. So we wanted, so we did is we, we applied the concept of singleton to it. So that way, at any point during the, the rendering process, we can actually uh, get the instance of this this particular B. The other thing we wanted is we wanted to use the, the factory concept as a way of, you know, you ask the factory, you, you pass the factory a subset of parameters and you get back the model. So instead of actually having to, to put it together yourself, uh, the, the, the code on the front end can just request the, this being based on these given parameters. Um, we also wanted it to be accessible. We wanted to be able to get it at any point uh, during the, the processing of the page, we wanted to have access to these models. Uh, we, we followed kind of the, the manager factory pattern that, that's kind of been around for a while in Java. And we also wanted this to be able to utilize the parallel API request using the YSF API client plugin. We had a lot of success with that with the plugin, you know, um, from the first couple of sites. And we didn't want to go away from that. And we still wanted to use the Chrome multi library and the wrapper. Uh, but the the issue that that I kind of ran into multiple times with this though is the way that it, it stores the keys when you set up an API request is it will it will do an MD5 hash on the array of parameters, which will guarantee that you you know you get a unique key each time. The problem with that is if you want to reference it in another piece of code, you're going to have to put together that array, and it's going to have to be in the same order so that you end up with the same key. Uh, I kind of want to go away from that a little bit in order to specify my key so that I can retrieve it later in a different object. So um, the way that we did that is we added, I created a uh, like a base manager class that would actually, uh, it, was, it, it would add all of the requests to an API client singleton but it would add them with the, the key that you specified, and then it would maintain its own hash of the key versus the, the API client's key. Uh, what, it, what it would also do is it would retrieve the results, store them locally, so that, um, and also construct the objects as requested um, via the managers. It would also handle any feed errors and return a null, rather than returning any kind of odd oddities that you might get back in an API call. Uh, all the builders ex that we have extend CMB Manager, and each one for each type of API call, there's two methods. You got a setup, and you have a get. The setup will basically queue this in, into the uh, API client for retrieval later. Um, you, you pass in your parameters and any options that need to, any HTTP options, and the set request. And notice that the the blog and blog post line that is actually using the YSF API client provider. Um, Setup that that's inherent with that uh, with that plugin. Uh, the get function will return uh, either an object or the value. I, I kind of I, I gave it the option because we have a, we have certain cases where you just want to include you know a static HTML file or something something of that sort where it's actually not going to have a container wrapped around it. Um, and in that case, you can you can pass uh, object equals false and, and you get that. But what it also does is it will pass the name of the class that, that should be instantiated and filled and uh, have the properties filled out. So each of our, and, th and these are all accessed via a, a manager class that is a singleton. So at any point that you've also that you've called setup, so you've called setup uh, early on in your actions class, on your template even, you can call the get method, pass the same name, and you'll get the same object returned. Uh, so then that led us to, to the next part point, which is the, the containers. And what, what we wanted to do here is a separation of the, basically where, where we were calling the setups, where we were setting up the values for the page. Um, so we, we figured out now a way to build the models, um, you know, relatively easily. But we needed to, you know, we needed to separate that from, from the operations that we were going to do on those models once, once they were built. Uh, so what we did here is uh, we extended the service container builder that Symphony had. Uh, but we knew we couldn't use it the way it, that it was because it was expecting to Build a completely build an object either from a DB or from another object. 
Um, so, so the changes that, that were made there were basically to allow it to instantiate this manager class and build the and return the bean from the factory rather than return the factory instance itself. Uh, the other thing about these is that they they're they're all lazy loaded. So, if you if you do hit uh, if you do have a service container, you don't necessarily have to use the uh, the different services to file within it. You can only use the ones that, that you need, and you won't load any until you call for the first one. Um, it, it, it instantiates the, the builder's view reflection, which was already built into the uh, service container builder. And as I said before, you know the customization that we did, we returned the, the function value if specified. If it's not specified, it will return the, ob the object that you did specify at the, the beginning of the actual manager class itself. Uh, and these containers there are actually defined via the route. So as you can see here, this is just a, a Rogo Symphony route, which would be blog slash blog name. The class that we're instantiating is the, the object host route. And the options are, this is actually the service container itself, the blog services. And the method that we're calling is get instance to get the singleton instance. And the rest of the parameters off are the, the action and the view. So at this point, what we've done is we've put an instance of the blog services uh, object in the scope of the um, blog action. So anything, any methods within that blog action can use the blog services object. Now if they don't, that's also okay because they're, all the objects are going to be lazy loaded. We're not going to make any calls if, if we don't need them. So before, uh, this is kind of an example of how we would use the API client and execute and build our uh, object. So we would, do, we would call the setups, we would execute the API, we would check for data, we would build each object. And that's, that's kind of the, the design pattern that we were, were having to use anytime we would add a new, a new object to the page or a new component, we would have to, to re basically repeat this over and over. So afterwards, what we're able to condense it down to is calling the setups, then calling the gifts, and this is all uh, from one class, and we end up with the exact same result. We end up with uh, you know three objects filled out, and that's actually, uh, actually what I did is I pulled this from from the ZDNet code versus the, you know some of the older code. So we're able to kind of condense that down to about six lines now, and you know I would like to condense to be able to condense it further, uh, not having to call the setups, but that was that was kind of the uh, kind of a necessary evil in being able to load these objects in parallel, because because you could have added it all into the Git functionality, but there wouldn't have been a way to tell it which to, to queue those requests so they have it in parallel, and the speed is a lot more important uh, in this instance than a few uh, lines of code that we had to add extra to do the sets. So uh, when you get to the, the to the point of actually seeing the containers mixed in with the builders that we talked about earlier, um, here you're registering uh, the you're, you're defining the service definition of blog meta uh, within the CMB blog manager class. Uh, you're setting a constructor get instance, and you're adding the method called get blog metadata result, and passing the array, which is the key name that we defined in the setup. So then, on the action class, if you want to, pick, if you want this object, you grab the the uh, service container variable, and and you just uh, ask for the blog meta uh, key, and at that point, you will actually re receive, retrieve the object from that particular API call. Uh, API reflection is also uh, something that, that, that we kind of put together with this one because now we were able to, to, to build them and, and go on the fly which was great for all the models and all the code that we that we had but now it seemed like there, there should be an easier way to generate these model classes because you know you know we can look at the XML and we know what needs to be built but we, we there shouldn't be you know we shouldn't have to go by hand and copy that and, and paste that into each model that we need to do so um, what I built, I built a, this small app actually just it, it runs via command line. But what it'll do is you'll pass it a feed. You just basically tell the name of the class, and it'll it will traverse the feed in the tree to determine the structure of the feed, and we'll create a PHP class um, that will contain all the attributes of the feed, and it'll check to see if it's an array, if it needs to be a nested object, and in which case it'll add the object instantiation to the feed. Uh, this actually saved us all, you know, a lot of time um, on this project because we were able to, anytime we added a new API, we're actually able to just run it through this when um, we end up with a model. 
uh, the next step, which is something that's coming soon, which is already something we've been working on, is actually generating that provider manager based on uh, based on a Waddle file that's generated for our API. Uh, when we developed our API, we we, we set it up to to kind of auto document to uh, create the Waddle files. And so what we're going to be able to do is take these Waddle files, kind of feed them into this generator, and it will actually be able to provide the the model and the provider for each. API method um, on a on a basis of, of, of our different platforms. Um, it'll also do like parameter name checking and it'll invoke automated model building. So it will actually be able to you'll be able to feed an API that will figure out all the different models that need to be built, build each model, and then go through and build the, the managers and the provider. So I mean and, you know to kind of recap, we, we went through a process of trying to figure out what, what type of ORM we could use for our, our, our uh, API-based system. Uh, we, we really didn't find any anything out there that you know that was off the shelf, so that's why we kind of went, went our own way with this. Uh, we went through and we, we built, we figured out a new way to build models to prevent uh, the copy-paste code that we had going on uh, on most of our uh, models and beans. Uh, we also went through and we investigated the service containers, and we found a way to not necessarily use them the way they were, but adapt them to, to the needs that we had um, to actually use them to instantiate our beans and send them forward. We also uh, heavily use the singleton design pattern. Um, that way we don't have to worry about scoping. We can, we can instantiate something in the container, in the action, or on the template, and have access to it throughout. And we also use reflection uh, in multiple instances here. We, we use a lot of reflection actually in the model builder itself, uh, which is not really is shown here because it was kind of, it's so this be a command line, um, but it'll it, you know, it will actually traverse the feed and determine, you know, what what attributes need to go with what feed and what, what types those attributes need to be. Uh, we also use it when we generate our classes uh, via the, the containers and the builders. Sorry about that, I probably went kind of fast, but <laughs> does anybody have any questions or anything? Yeah. Have you uh, thought about open sourcing machine using the need for uh, to build those for and contributing it back to the wire wire stuff and things like that? Uh, we well what we did, we didn't actually extend or yeah. Yeah, the, the, the Symphony stuff. Um, we haven't really talked about it. Uh, we, we didn't make, if I made a lot of changes to, to the YSF stuff, I would have, uh, you know, contacted them to, to see about, you know, if they were wanting to be used elsewhere. Uh, the manager stuff's kind of new. We just, we just kind of did, we were kind of seeing how it works. You know, it's kind of a trial <laughs> as well for us. Um, it's, it's, it's really pretty simple, but yeah, it, I mean, it, it definitely is something that could be added into the, into the Symphony code base as far as, you know, the extended pawn. And the, the things that we changed with this, where we extended the Symphony code base were really, Points that needed to be customized just in our environment. They weren't. They weren't really anything that could be contributed back to, to Symphony because I kind of had to change the way that they designed it to work. Um, you know, unless unless you know with, with some refactoring and adding some uh, some functionality to Symphony, we could really those those don't make too much sense as far as contributing back. But the the, the manager classes they could def that's definitely something that we could we could look to do. But yeah, we're gonna take a look. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. In, in short, yeah. <laughs> this is pretty interesting for um, one of my first I guess, exposures to anybody using PHP in an enterprise situation. Um, do you know any other enterprises doing using PHP for this um, for you know operations and that kind of thing? I know that Yahoo is using it for. Uh, yeah. Or some things. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> GameSpot, yeah. Right yeah. Those yeah, are the only. Yeah. Yeah. Facebook, too, yeah. Yeah. Facebook. Yeah. Sort of PHP. Yeah. Yeah. Are the other business units 
using your same model of value saving? Um, I guess kind of looking at uh, how you're going to build their APIs as well, or just kind of more tightening the process of getting this fairly heterogeneous. Um, you know, the, the CNET group really kind of drove the project, and they were they set the, the golden standard for kind of what the what API um, syntax should be across the organization so we could reuse a lot of functionality. Um, but in terms of how we actually implement that, in terms of what the what the various um, architectures look like, um, that was, you know, really um, decisions specific to each group. It really depended on sort of what that group had, how they were going to use it, again, uh, what their business requirements were. And, and each group has a very different set of business requirements. How much of the Iris data code is written against an exact point version of Symfony? So if they change, the Iris needs to change as well. Um, there's really not. Uh, now, there's a lot. There's a lot of it written for the version we're on now. If they, as far as the upgrade path, we're we're still pretty. It still should be pretty easily upgraded there. But I think there's there's maybe two or three classes that we that we've extended upon that we would have to investigate going forward. Now going backward would be would be you know another issue entirely. But <laughs> yeah. uh, you know if, if we remove features, but um, as far as as far as new things and as far as what we extended upon, there's there's really only probably two or three core classes that we that we would really have to take a look at. So as far as upgrades. Yeah, the, the approach that we took um, in terms of. Um, viewed in Symphony is, is we're, we we want to utilize Symphony for its strengths as a framework, and that's really kind of the um, the intent. But in terms of the way that we actually deal with models and our model objects, they, they're they're not really bound to Symphony in, in any uh, in any way that's sort of um, uh, inflexible. You know, we, we <coughs> utilize some of Symphony's uh, um, logging calls and things like that, but those are you know sort of pre Pretty tiny. <laughs> yeah. Is this something you're going to extend during the public API you guys up or keep it? Public API? Um, <coughs> you know, uh, right now, I mean, the, the way, you know, uh, our business unit is, is um, sort of using the API, as I mentioned earlier, is primarily for sort of internal purposes and for the partnership and that sort of thing. Um, we don't currently just have, have a lot of use cases where we're offering sort of, um, sort of widgets out in the world and that sort of thing. Uh, if, if that came up or if one of our product folks sort of um, developed a plan around that, you know, then, then we can look at, look at things. But, but right now, it's, it's primarily for internal purposes. Yeah, CNET is a unit business unit has the Not really a lot of demand for you know we use our business kind of thing. You know, kind of really glamorous website. You know. that picture is hot on the slide. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, yeah, I mean, if you want to, you know, if you think of any way to use it, you know, feel free to email us. Oh. You can email us. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Sure. So the question is, uh, besides the the cash farm that's attached to the API, or anything that we're doing to improve performance. Um, so uh, as mentioned before, each each backend system is essentially autonomous, right? That's running through the API. So each of those systems has, you know, various um, means of, of dealing with performance themselves, as well. You know, so um, you know, a, as an example, um, we use uh, Solar Apache Solar for um, for search indexes. And Solar's got a fine caching system built into it. So most of the time we use Solar, there's, there's no caching at all applied at the API level. It's just straight pass through. Um, uh, so, um, so it really sort of depends on what the back end system is. Um, we do utilize uh, and are starting to utilize a little bit more in some very kind of specific instances, some of the uh, file level caching that Symphony actually provides. 
Um, so, uh, you know, and we're, and we're kind of experimenting with it right now um, at, at a very basic level. Uh, but, I mean, certainly uh, um, that there's a lot of room to grow there. I mean, I think, um, and, and this, is, this is more my opinion than anybody else's, is, is that, you know, caching is, is great, but if you start stacking up your caches all over the place, then you have synchronization issues, you know, all the way down your pipe. So as much as we can kind of, you know, sort of isolate the caching that we're going to do in, in points that are really controllable, um, we try to do that. Changing the language that runs on some of the pieces of the stack. And for example, the middle layer, the API that you change the Java or whatever. Is there a specific reason? I can only imagine why you started on PHP, but is there, you know, is there any discussion about taking parts of this in other languages and foreign well, I think you know the main thing. We have a lot of uh, a lot of different developers, and they 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 kind of specialize in a lot of different things. So, uh, and you know, really, I I feel like you know since I've been here, we've, we've We've pretty been much been like language agno agnostic. Uh, you know, whatever, we're going to use whatever tool we need to use. You know, to, that, that fits the need of, of the application itself. You know, we don't we don't try to necessarily. You know, get it move everything to one particular language. You know, because it may be easier to support, or you know, because of, of one strength over another. Because it may not fit with with the platform that, that you know with what we're trying to accomplish with this particular platform. So I, I don't think we've we've really looked at to, you know trying to consolidate that. Really at any any point. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're, again, we're pretty language agnostic. Um, uh, having said that, um, there's a huge user base for PHP. Um, it's a it's a uh, it's a platform that that folks come up to speed on pretty quickly. Um, our producers uh, who do most of our front end work um, are you know they're very comfortable with it. They are also doing a lot of JSP work too, so um, so they can kind of flip around if they need to, but. Uh, um, but it's it's kind of given us the the efficiencies that, that we need for now. Um, the, one of the key parts of our API strategy, though, is is that because the API is sitting in the middle of the universe, you know, at, at the end of the day, the front end um, doesn't necessarily matter. And as we continue to develop the API, we're pushing more business logic back into it, so that um, so we can actually have more flexibility about how we serve the front end, particularly if we start serving services that would. Would shoot past our, you know, our typical stack. Yeah. What sort of metrics are you gathering from this stuff? In terms of just performance metrics, and um, yeah, performance metrics, cache metrics. Um, uh, we just started. Actually, we're sort of. It's a good question because we're sort of in the in the early processes of really kind of establishing what. Um, you know, what metrics we really care the most about. I mean, uh, as we're migrating sites, the first metric we care about is this site better be at least as fast as the last one was. And uh, um, so that's a pretty simple metric, you know, and, and hopefully it's better. Um, you know, but as we get into more precision, we're, we're certainly looking at, um, you know, uh, uh, certain page, you know, basic, all the basic things, you know, page load, um, throughput from the API for, uh, forward, you know, is there latencies that we need to measure or, or sort of adapt to? Um, and we're we're not done by any you know any means in terms of the things that we want to do and the, the ways we want to really leverage this architecture. Um, and as we kind of continue to explore that, you know, those the metrics sort of sort of introduce themselves. I think. Yeah. Um, First API was in Java and then basically rebid it in PHP, right? Or yeah. I just, so. yeah uh, we actually we have an API too. The, the APIs are actually being being sent forward by a by a Java application that kind of sits in the middle that, that pulls the data. Uh, the PHP platform is actually the, the front end that, that serves the pages. So it is, you know, basically our primary, you know, pretty much only user of the API system. So so basically we've, we've got Java pulling the data from the platform. And we've got this PHP front end that's pulling the pulling the data from the Java app. It's this one kind of collection of all the of all the data. All right. Thank you very much.